I'm Rene Ritchie, and if you think Apple Silicon is just about giving us MacBooks that are more like iPads, well, then you, my friend, are 100% completely out of your mind palace wrong. It's also about giving us iMacs that are more like iPads. Wait, what? Sponsored by CuriosityStream, now bundled with my streaming service, Nebula. I've just covered the potential of Apple Silicon MacBook Air and MacBook Pro, and I've got a full-on Intel iMac review coming your way fast. So hit that subscribe button and bell, and then, what's something no one's ever said before on YouTube? Oh, I know, let's just jump into it. The first iMac from 1998, the one Steve Jobs and Johnny Ive carved out of their fever dreams, survival hopes, and translucent Bondi blue plastic looked like a CRT screen with a computer just jammed up all inside it because that's exactly what it was. That was the whole point of it. Just like the original beige block Macintosh. Simplify, simplify, simplify. And then delete those last two simplifies because you don't need them. You just need the screen. The second iMac from 2002 went LCD, but couldn't quite fit the computer behind the thinner, at least thinner for back then, newfangled display. So instead, Ivan Company went with the far more playful Pixar lamp style look and just shoved all of the guts down into the base. The third iMac from 2006 though, that's where Apple landed on the still current grand design of display plus chin plus an L-shaped stand. Back then it was plastic and relatively squat like an iPod. But in 2007, it went all bead blasted aluminum, like an iPhone. In 2009, it went widescreen. In 2012, razor edged and bubble backed. And in 2014, full on 5K. And in 2020, this is still what we have now. And I get it, I totally get it. On one hand, this design is just iconic. It's the Porsche 911 excuse cliche of Porsche 911 design cliches. On the other hand, any previous desires Apple may have entertained about thinning and flattening it out again, giving it that shave and a beard cut so many of us have been longing for for so long, well, all of that was just order 66 by Intel's near half a decade of die shrink failures. And so we've been effectively in a holding pattern with this pattern. Until now, that is, when rumors are swirling that the iMac may finally, mother of dragons, finally be getting that iPad Pro style makeover. And I know, I know, that's what the rumors are saying about pretty much everything in Apple's lineup these days. From the iPhone to the MacBooks to the other iPads, just everything is gonna look like the iPad Pro, which I guess means Apple's design language is about to get real consistent, real fast, or these rumors are just for real lacking in any amount of imagination or contextual awareness. But either way, I don't see the bead blasted aluminum unibody and glass going away anytime soon. That's all still just too foundational for Apple and too durable for customer type people for it all to be changed simply for the sake of change. But I can see Apple flattening out that bubble back again and going for something that indeed does look more futuristic and floaty, but with some retro hard lines to the industrial design. Not too thin, mind you. TV sets may be getting damn near two dimensional these days, but I still want my computers to be sturdy. Kind of exactly how the iPad Pro is on the new Magic Keyboard. Just, you know, if the keyboard was an L-shaped stand instead of a keyboard. And if that appeals to you, hit the like button and let's just see how high we can get it to go. The iMac has always had a bleeding edge display. It went LCD early on, then LED, IPS, and just all the three letter jumbles. Most recently, it's gone 5K for retina density resolution, DCI-P3 for wide gamut color, True Tone for ambient color matching, and even gotten a nano texture option to reduce glare while maintaining contrast. In other words, just year over year, for as little as Apple has changed the window frame, wow, but have they improved the view. So the next obvious step is still <laughs> wicked obvious. Just Thanos snap those bezels, just delete them by half, at least, do literally what Apple has done to the iPad Pro, just instead of leaving no country for old home buttons, leave nothing for that logo. Rumor also has it that Apple is planning to increase the size of the current 4K iMac from 21.5 inches to 24 inches, and the 5K iMac from 27 inches to 30 inches, which would be immersive to the point of enthralling, provided your workspace could handle it. But 30 inches is the current size of the Pro Display XDR, and I'm not just all for it, I'm all about it. The whole point of an iMac is to have the biggest Apple display possible. So just give us exactly that, the biggest Apple display possible. That way even our windows can have windows. And if it takes 6K to keep it retina, like the Pro Display, well, 
I think that's a sacrifice most of us are more than willing to make. Now, the next rumor is where it gets really exciting, mini LED. Yeah, not OLED. OLED has issues that can be mitigated on static refresh rate phones and TVs, but just don't seem to be able to be worked around with the kind of dynamic refresh rates and color management technology Apple really wants in their panels, at least not yet. But mini LED, mini LED has a number of the same advantages as OLED, but without some of the drawbacks. Basically, it uses like 10,000 tiny 200 micron LEDs grouped into local dimming zones so it can get closer to those deep inky blacks, giving it contrast ratios similar to OLED, but without the burn-in, off-axis color shifts and white point changes that just stack up on OLED. It also might allow for adaptive refresh rates, what Apple calls ProMotion on the iPad Pro. That's what lets the display ramp up to 120 hertz for silky smooth scrolling and brain bending gaming, but also ramp way down to 48 hertz, even 24 hertz for things like accurately presenting 24 frames per second content in Final Cut Pro and TV Plus. What I'm not so sure about is peak or sustained brightness levels. Apple is delivering that to the extreme dynamic range with the Pro Display, which is still LED, but they have to drive a fan-fueled cooling system to do it. Now, if there's an iMac Pro SKU that wants to go XDR, I'd be all for that as well, because I'm all about the high-end options on the high end. But for the regular iMac, I think nice HDR would be blissfully good enough. And by good enough, I mean the instant I look at it, I know I'll just want to move into it and live inside it. Now, could target display mode come back, where you plug your MacBook into your iMac and just use it as a ginormous monitor? And I honestly don't know. It originally went away because Apple had to work around Intel's lack of 5K bandwidth support by building their own custom timing controller, essentially stitching two display streams together. And that only worked internally. I'm hoping though, I'm hoping that once Apple controls the whole stack, they can bring it all back, any and Audi. But I have no idea how easy or how high up on the priority list that may even be. Same with multi-touch and Apple Pencil support. I mean, I want it. I want it bad. I came up as an artist and a designer and the Surface Studio just still makes me drool. But like anything when it comes to multi-touch Macs, I'll expect it only when I see it. Let me know how you feel in the comments. The latest iMac is also the last Intel iMac and it's just chocked full of 10th generation Comet Lake cores that aren't much faster than 9th generation cores, but do offer to ramp the core count up from eight to 10 to make up for it. In terms of performance though, not efficiency. Like with the MacBook Pro, I imagine the iMac was designed with Intel actually maintaining their TikTok schedule in mind. But since Intel is still stuck in a TikTok, talk, talk, optimize, optimize, optimize hell, and at 14 nanometer for desktop, Apple is moving on to their own custom silicon, which might not only debut with the new ARM V9 instruction set architecture, or ISA, but on Taiwan Semiconductor's new five nanometer process as well. Now, I've done a few deep dives on what exactly that means for the Mac already, so check out the links in the description. Apple's head of platform technologies though, Johnny Saruji, has said there'll be a family of SOCs, of systems on a chip. That means instead of having a CPU, GPU, RAM, and all the other base computing components just all laid out on the motherboard like a platter, it has them all stacked together on a single die, like a sandwich. How Apple scales their currently all mobile SOCs to full on iMac style desktop class silicon though, is gonna be really interesting to see. Also, how things like user accessible memory modules will be handled in a world where you don't have to worry just about things being welded to the board, but actually fabbed into the chip. And maybe that just all goes away, or maybe Apple makes some kind of ultra high speed expander system, like the modules they've been making for the new Mac Pro. Same with discrete graphics cards. With a GPU on the chip, is there room for an AMD style option? Or something like the Afterburner Accelerator, a reprogrammable ASIC that could make the iMac even more focused on ProRes for video or signal processing for audio, or whatever any specific Creative Pro wants it to be. Or could Apple make an iMac SOC for consumers and an even more powerful iMac Pro SOC for pros to better cater to both ends of the market? You know, the first without fans, so it's whisper quiet for those who want ultimate stealth, and the second with fans, so it's ultra cool for those who want maximum sustained performance. I have so many questions. Let me know what you want the answers to be in the comments below. The MacBook Pro got a T1 chip and Touch ID four years ago. Just this month, the iMac got a T2 chip, but still no Touch ID. And actually, that makes the kind of sense that sorta does, I think. I mean, at least if you wanna keep everything secured through a hardware channel, because the T2 chip is inside the computer, 
not the keyboard. And that's what handles checking the mathed out Touch ID data against the mathed out data from your registered fingerprint before releasing the authentication token. So if you wanna keep that all local, you'd still need the T2 chip in the computer to handle the encryption, the acceleration, the component controllers, and at least a T1 in the keyboard to handle Touch ID. T2 being the equivalent of an iPhone 7 chip and T1 being the equivalent of an Apple Watch 2 chip, which wouldn't just make for a lot of redundancy, it would make for a more expensive keyboard. And buying and replacing more keyboards that are more expensive just because they have secure elements inside them and not for any like justifiable reason, they're space gray or something, would suck. But you know what wouldn't suck and would very neatly solve this exact problem at the same time? Right, Face ID. We already don't need a T2 chip in an Apple Silicon iMac. Like, at all because the new Apple Silicon SOC will include all the secure enclave you could ever want, plus an A&E or Apple Neural Engine to handle the neural networks necessary for Face ID. And because it uses a true depth camera mounted above the screen instead of a capacitive fingerprint sensor in the keyboard, we wouldn't have to include any extra more expensive tech in the keyboard either. Would it really be any faster to unlock than the Apple Watch's proximity based system? I mean, race you for it, but you wouldn't have to own an Apple Watch and it wouldn't unlock when you just walked past it, only when you looked intently at it. Apple's been avoiding Wi-Fi 6 on the Mac line, which is just weird given how fast they've adopted it on the iPhone and iPad. Now, there have been some issues with Wi-Fi 6 in the past, so it's possible Apple's been waiting for their own custom silicon before bringing it to the Mac. So hopefully this gives us that. I'd also love to see a U1 chip, not because I relish the idea of carrying around my iMac just to find my iPhone or air tagged keys or anything, but because it'd allow me to specifically target my iMac for airdrop. And if Apple could combine Bluetooth, Wi-Fi 6 and U1 and make an even faster, like run Barry run speed force faster version of airdrop, well, I love that even harder. An iMac can be many different things to different people. A front of house centerpiece for a shop, a workstation for creatives or studios, a hub for families, but all of those things require all of the ports. The current Intel iMac has a 3.5 millimeter headphone jack, SDXC card reader, four times USB-A, two times USB-C slash Thunderbolt 3, and ethernet. And honestly, I just wouldn't change a thing. Kidding, totally kidding. USB-C Thunderbolt 3 should go to USB 4 and Thunderbolt 4. And I think it's time for four of those and let USB-A drop down at two. And if you have any other ideas, let me know. Now, I don't think the Magic Keyboard or Magic Trackpad are in any urgent need of an update. I know some people really like the touch bar in the MacBook Pro. And yeah, some people really do. And want it on the iMac and Mac Pro keyboard as well. And if Apple really believes it's a better touch future for the Mac, well, they should have had it there like three years ago at the latest. But aside from the same cost factor drawbacks as Touch ID on the keyboard, it's just really hard to read Apple on that specific tech. The Magic Mouse though, the Magic Mouse is really long past overdue for a makeover. When Apple first switched it from batteries to rechargeable, but just sort of stuck the port right where they swapped the batteries out, it was like, fine, whatever, short term solution. But it's been five years now. And it's not just because it looks silly when it's charging, like an upside down turtle, though it does. It's that you can't use it when it's charging or when it's plugged in if you simply prefer not to use it wirelessly, like you've always been able to do with the Magic Keyboard and the Magic Trackpad. And Apple Silicon, I know, can't fix that. But Apple Industrial Design and Hardware Engineering <laughs> sure can. The latest Intel iMac gives the old potato of a camera a serious tater tot level upgrade. It's 1080p now, back illuminated and computationally enhanced by the T2 chip's image signal processor. That's equivalent to the iPhone 7. I imagine even the first Apple Silicon iMac will have an ISP closer to the iPhone 12, maybe even iPhone 13, which should make it damn near terrific, like poutine. But really, it should be as good as an iPad or iPhone camera. And if there's ever a new ASI iMac Pro, that should be 4K at least. We use these computers for production. Let us produce. For speakers, the 16 inch MacBook Pro already shows the way forward. Because the iMac doesn't sit on a table and isn't relatively narrow like the MacBook Pro, it won't need to do things in the same way, like force canceling the woofers or computationally spacing out the soundstage. But the end result should be the same. It should sound the same. Like Apple flattened out a HomePod and just shoved it inside the casing. Or like you have a Dolby Atmos theater system just projecting out all around you. Spoiler alert. Apple sells way more iOS devices than Macs and way more MacBooks than Mac desktops. Of the Mac desktops that Apple sells though, the iMac is by far the most popular. 
So while I don't expect the iMac to get priority over the MacBooks in terms of when they come to market, I do expect them to keep pace in terms of how they fit into the market. And what I mean by that is, I think at first prices will stay relatively the same. Whatever Apple saves on Intel chips will be spent paying down Apple Silicon chips and adding new technology, like I'm very much hoping true depth cameras for Face ID. But over time, I'm also hoping Apple will follow the same strategy they've been using with iOS devices. Let that paid down technology drive down prices on the entry level machines. Let the latest iMacs and iMac Pros be the greatest, like the iPhone 12 and iPhone 12 Pro, or the iPad Pro, but then let those same parts be repackaged later into the iMac equivalent of the iPhone SE or 10.2 inch iPad. That's how and where I see Apple maintaining their ASP or average selling price, but expanding the market at the same time, both for pros and for the far more massive mainstream, sort of like what we're trying to do with Nebula the streaming video platform I'm building along with my education creator friends like Sam from Wendover, who sounds an awful lot like Sam from Half is Interesting, Real Science, Real Engineering, Jenny Ma, Mary Spender, and so many more. It's a place where none of us, none of us need to worry about the demonetization or the tyranny of click-through rate or watch time or the algorithm or ads. And yeah, you can find all of my videos there completely ad-free. Some of them, like my last two videos on Apple versus Epic and the iPhone 12 event preview, even have extra sections. Tangents that just didn't make any sense on YouTube, where retention rate is everything, but work just perfectly fine on Nebula. Also, the full 45 minute long video versions of the interviews I've done with iJustine, Brian Tong, Walt Mossberg, and more. So, what does any of this have to do with CuriosityStream? Well, as the go-to source for the best documentaries on the internet, they just love educational content and educational creators. And we worked out a deal where if you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description, not only will you get CuriosityStream, but you'll also get a Nebula subscription for free. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering 26% off all of their annual plans. And 26% off is, by contract, the best deal you'll find anywhere. So. Click the link in the description and get both CuriosityStream and Nebula for 26% off. Or you can go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie. It's a great way to support this channel and educational content directly for just $14.79 per year. Just click on the link in the description or go to curiositystream.com slash Renee Ritchie. And clicking on the link just really helps out the channel. Thanks CuriosityStream and thanks to all of you for your support. Check out my Apple Silicon playlist for more and see you next video.